Well, dear friends, the rule of the Antichrist will exceed all of the deceptions and the wickedness of Hitler a thousandfold. And for good reason. Notice in verse 2 at the end. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now, again, it is hard to imagine what this world will be like once the church is removed. But think of the utter freefall of morality when the Holy Spirit steps aside as we know he will according to the prophecy we read in 2 Thessalonians 2 7 where the Apostle Paul tells us when he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and the Greek literally steps aside which he will do at the midpoint of the tribulation and this will allow Satan's dictator to rule without restraint for 42 months for the last half of the tribulation. Next, the Lord reveals to us the, the incredible deception that Satan will use through the Antichrist to unite the world in worshiping him. This third theme is his counterfeit death. Notice verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Now, the personal pronoun his combined with verse 12 and 14, as well as chapter 17, verses 8 and 11, helps us understand that this fatal wound does not refer to the destruction and subsequent healing of one of the nations, but it rather refers to the Antichrist himself as a person. And this also explains why the world's amazement will galvanize them together in this vast religious and political enterprise as they will follow after the beast. Now, we're not told the specifics here of what happens, but we are told that he will supposedly die and come back to life. A counterfeit death and resurrection of Christ now, we're all familiar with what I like to call the world of religious world wrestling, where people go in and watch some of these phony faith healers heal people. However, I would add that the smoke and mirrors of Benny Hinn, dear friends, will absolutely pale in comparison to the deceptions of the false prophet that will be introduced later on next week in verses 12 through 15. In fact, Paul describes this powerful trickery in 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning in verse 9. Here's what he says. The one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they may, might believe what is false in order that they all may, may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. And we know according to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4 that whenever a man turns away his ears from the truth, he will turn aside unto myths. And by now, during the tribulation, those who have heard the truth and rejected that will be literally overcome by the myth of worshiping the Antichrist. They will experience the deluding influence that God will send upon them, again, as Paul said, because they did not receive the love of the truth. And at this point, God will judicially seal them in the tomb of their unbelief. Well, his counterfeit death leads to number four, his global worship. Verse four, and they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast. Now, keep in mind that by now, the cataclysmic judgments of the seal and the trumpet, trumpet judgments have, have killed billions, and the inhabitants of the earth will be living in utter terror. And yet we know according to the biblical record, they will continue to blaspheme the God of glory, their only hope of salvation. It's inconceivable. But an amazing shift begins to take place at this point in the tribulation. The world that embraced this whole ecumenical, pluralistic 
great harlot church where all of the religions finally learn to coexist will suddenly bow their knee to the Antichrist. And Christianity and Christ will be public enemy number one, as well as all of the Jews who will now begin to not only reject the Antichrist, but will begin to embrace the living Christ. After seeing the death of the Antichrist, I'm sure many will be amazed to see him come back to life, and they will probably, since so many people believe in reincarnation, believe that that's what has happened here. And they're probably going to want the same. They're going to see, my goodness, all of this death and destruction around us. Look what happened. He died. He can come back to life. Undoubtedly, that will be part of the lie that will get them to follow him, that he can offer them some measure of salvation. So by worshiping the Antichrist, they will unwittingly be worshipers of Satan, the one who empowers him. Isn't it fascinating? Satan is so powerful that he can actually deceive people into worshiping him, the very one that will damn them. They will say in verse 4, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? So they will see him as being an invincible God. So we've seen his demonic origin, his world empire, his counterfeit death, and his global worship. Fifthly, let's look at his arrogant blasphemies in verse 5. And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. I love this. Notice it says, there was given to him. Here the Lord reminds us that ultimately he is the sovereign God who has ordained these sufferings. I can hear it now, people saying, no, 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 no. Not a God of love. He would never do that. Beloved, you must understand that on the basis of Scripture we see that while our holy God is never the cause of sin and evil, we do see that he brings it about indirectly through the willing, voluntary actions of moral creatures that will be held accountable for their actions. This is clearly the testimony of the Word of God. He himself said in Isaiah 45, verse 7, for example, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. We know that he did this, according to Romans 9, verses 18 through 24, in order to dramatically display his glory through his holiness and his wrath and his mercy and his grace, his love and his power. I ask you, for example, did not God decree that Jesus would die upon the cross? The Bible makes it clear that he did so by his predetermined plan. And I ask you, is God more or less glorified because he ordained evil to enter the world? Let, let, let me ask it differently. Is God more or less glorified because he ordained Jesus to die on the cross? Obviously. Had he not done that, we would have never known the heights of his holiness and the depths of his grace. So knowing that God is in charge, beloved, is a source of great comfort for all of us, but especially for these dear people that are coming to Christ during this time of unbelievable suffering. This will be great encouragement to them for God to basically say, listen, I'm in charge here. I'm in charge here. I have given to him the freedom to do these things, but I'm in charge. Remember the promised blessing in chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Beloved, this is an example of that. 